We've been having discussions on the Facebook group for my online courses, Robotics Learn by Building. Several people have been asking about an almost identical challenge, uh, a topic which I had just recently discussed in course three, Robotic Drives and Physics. The challenge was to be able to pick up a raw egg with a robot arm without breaking the egg. Now it's an excellent challenge, and so I thought I'd throw together this science short to show you one way you can tackle that challenge. Picking up a raw chicken egg with a robot gripper is not an easy task. The first point I'd like to make, though the challengers have probably thought about this already, is having soft rubber tipped fingers on your gripper, which have a lot of traction with smooth surfaces like the surface of an egg. This allows you to apply the minimum pressure to hold the egg. The second thing, which is the more complicated part, is controlling how much pressure you apply with the gripper fingers. Having a mechanical slip clutch with on your gripper drive mechanism is finicky, uh, very hard and near impossible to calibrate and unreliable. What you really need is to set up a servo system of some kind. So like I mentioned in a recent blog post on Jetpack Academy, a servo system has a closed feedback loop. It has a drive mechanism driving the load, feedback going into the controller, telling it what happened to the load, and the controller controlling the drive mechanism. A lot of people have only heard of hobby servos, which are true servos, but a servo is actually a generic system involving this closed loop. With hobby servos, they are positional servos. They fight to get to and hold a specific position. They have a variable resistor potentiometer attached to the drive shaft, which is the feedback to the onboard control circuit to tell it whether or not it needs to turn the motor one way or the other or hold its position. You may have hobby a hobby servo driving your gripper, Perfect, <laughs> but position is not the feedback we want on our gripper because the egg diameter will be unknown. What we need is pressure feedback. We need to know how much pressure we are applying to the gripper fingertips. And there's a few ways we can do this. And in another science short, I'll show you how to make resistive pressure sensors using silicone, graphite powder, and acrylic paint, which you can get at the hardware store or just make. In this science short, we're going to make a capacitive pressure sensor. Capacitors are one of the most common electronic components you'll encounter, and they are surprisingly simple in construction. In my electricity and electronics course of my robotics series, we actually make a capacitor and use it in a noise generator circuit. We're going to do the same thing here for demonstration. A capacitor is simply two metal plates really close together, but separated by an insulator. That's it. That's all it is. <laughs> I won't explain here how a capacitor works, but all you need to know is that the larger the plates are, the higher the capacitance. The closer the plates get, the higher the capacitance. Flip that coin over. If the plates get farther apart, the capacitance gets smaller. So we're going to make a variable capacitor. You can see I've just cut up some copper clad fiberglass board used to make circuit boards. I've soldered some wires to them. Voila, there's our plates. In fact, just holding them this close together, they have capacitance. It's a very small value in the picofarad range. I did the math and this one is about 15 picofarads when the plates are about six millimeters apart. If I put some insulating but squishable foam in between the plates and I use that capacitor in a 555 timer circuit, 
Set up to generate a tone, you can hear the frequency change depending on how much pressure I put on the plates and how much the plates get squished together. Now, the pink foam might actually be interfering a little here because this is anti-static foam used for transporting static sensitive electronic components. This black foam, however, is just plain old closed cell foam I actually cut off from a foam paintbrush. It's very soft and squishable, so it would probably be better suited for our figure to pressure sensor. Now, my multimeter actually has a capacitance measuring option, but the capacitance was too small to register. However, I can also measure frequency with this multimeter. And if we know the resistances in the timer circuit, we can calculate the capacitance. So in my first course, Electricity and Electronics, one of the lessons available for free preview was a bonus lesson on the 555 timer and making it do what you want it to. Uh, the link is in the description below and there's two cheat sheets you can download. The 555 mono stable cheat sheet and the 555 a staple cheat sheet so here i'm looking at the a stable cheat sheet because that's the circuit i built up for this demonstration and here's the formula for calculating the frequency generated by the incredibly useful 555 timer chip for my demonstration circuit, the largest resistors I had on hand were one mega ohm. To get the frequency down to the range of human, human hearing, I had to daisy chain them. So my total resistance for R1 was six mega ohms and R2 was three mega ohms. When I just used one mega ohm resistors for R1 and R2, the frequency of my squishable sensor went from about 32 kilohertz down to about 24 kilohertz. So this is beyond the range of human hearing, but the faster frequency is better for what we want to do. Because the next step you want to tackle is, okay, we have a varying frequency. What do we do with that information now? And again, there's a couple of ways you could do that. Uh, let's go with the assumption that the drive motor on your gripper is a hobby servo. They operate by varying a pulse width on the signal wire that's between one and two milliseconds. So one millisecond pulse turns the servo all the way one direction, two milliseconds turns it all the way the opposite direction. A 1.5 millisecond pulse turns it halfway. And so all the times in between one and two milliseconds turns the servo to different positions in typically a 180 degree rotation, thereabouts. It's expecting a pulse about every 50th of a second. So you can do it like we did in my first robotics course, set up a circuit with two 555 timers. The first timer is in a stable mode, so it's sending out a pulse train of around 50 hertz. Uh, the servos are very forgiving on this. Your frequency here could be way off and it will still work. The pin three output from this timer goes to pin two, of the second timer, which is set up in monostable mode. So every time it gets a pulse from the first timer, this timer chip sends out a pulse, but how long the pulse goes high is determined by R1 and C1, which you are replacing with your capacitive pressure sensor. Now my pressure sensor plates are about 23 millimeters by 12 millimeters and the black foam kept them apart about six millimeters, which gave us about 15 picofarads to uh, 20 picofarads when it was compressed to maximum. We want our pulse to be in the one millisecond range, but the capacitance is way off the chart uh, on my cheat sheet 
because it's such a small value, but I can actually guesstimate. We'd be two divisions below this scale. So somewhere around here, we go over to the one millisecond column and that spot lines up pretty close with the slope of the 100 mega ohm resistance. So here's what I would do. I'd probably stick a really high value potentiometer, like, you know, 10 mega ohms if I had it, in series with a 100 mega ohm resistor and use that for R1. That's just a guess to get me started. I can fine tune it once I actually got the circuit working with a servo. By varying the pot, I can change the pulse width according to demand and the capacitive pressure sensor changes the capacitance according to pressure on the fingertip, which will also change the pulse width some more. You would have to have your servo set up, your servo drive uh, direction set up so that two millis the two millisecond pulse width opens the gripper and removes pressure from the fingertip. In this way, the capacitor and resistor try to fight each other to balance the frequency and get just the right amount of pressure that you have set using the pot. Another way you can use the variable capacitance is to use the capacitive pressure sensor as C1 in an A-stable circuit, just like in my demonstration, send the output pulses to your microcontroller, like an Arduino, and have it count the pulses in a set amount of time. Let's say it counts pulses for one second. Yes, that's a long time, but hey, you're in no rush, right? <laughs> so just work with me for a second here. On my example circuit, I used a one mega ohm resistor for both R1 and R2. And I was getting frequencies of between 32 kilohertz and 24 kilohertz if I squished it to maximum. That's a difference of 8,000 pulses per second. So theoretically, I can sense 8,000 different pressures. Now, obviously it's not that accurate, but it's certainly fair to say, I probably have a choice of a thousand different pressures that I can measure with reasonable accuracy. But cut your sample time or your you know, pulse counting time, cut it down to one tenth of a second. You'll still be able to see a difference of 800 pulses that you could count. So you could tell how much pressure you're putting on the fingertips, your Arduino, is actually controlling the servo's position. So you program the Arduino to change the position of the servo to apply more or less pressure as needed. The Arduino now has a method of sensing how much pressure is being applied to the object the gripper is grabbing. So don't be afraid to set your frequency very high. The more pulses per second you get, the higher the accuracy. Now, there are limits, of course, limits to how fast the Arduino can count, for example, all while it's multitasking and driving the servo or perhaps several servos. <laughs> okay, I hope that helps. If some of this seemed very technical to you, then perhaps you should consider enrolling in my online courses on robotics at jetpackacademy.com where we go through learning all about robots and robotics by building them. Take a tour of the courses. We start from scratch of no knowledge about the topic and work through electricity and electronics, then through digital electronics with microcontrollers like the PIC and Arduino, then through robotic drives and physics. In course four, you take all that you've learned thus far and apply it with new skills in prototyping to build a 3D printer, which is basically a robot. In course five, we take your robots to the next level by making them autonomous. That is uh, able to navigate on its own or you can make changes to the robot remotely. And we even explore artificial intelligence and decision-making. The courses each have 
many free previews of lessons so you can see for yourself why over 15,000 people have enrolled in the courses from over 140 different countries. Also, do check out my other science shorts on this channel where we experiment with all things science and tech, not just robotics. Things like alternative energies, genetics, internet of things, you name it, uh, I'll be adding them continually. And of course, please like and subscribe. Thanks and have a great day.